Show me the money. This is the MoneyWeb Be a Better Investor podcast. Picking the brains of professional investors on their investment strategies, successes, and mistakes. Your host, Rick Fanica. Welcome to this week's edition of the Be a Better Investor podcast. My name is Rijk van Niekerk and in this podcast series I speak to finance and investment professionals about their investment journeys and why they chose a career in managing other people's money and also their investment decisions before they turned pro. The idea is to find a few golden nuggets of wisdom to assist amateur retail investors to become better investors. My guest today is Abdul Davids. He's a portfolio manager and head of research at Kamisa Asset Management. Abdul was also the head of research at Kahiso, but before joining Kahiso, he was a senior analyst at Alan Gray and a financial manager at Vendel Air Industries. He is a CFA charter holder. Abdul, thank you so much for your time today. First of all, give us a bit of background. Where did you grow up and what career? did you dream of when you were still at school? Thank you for the opportunity, Rick. I think my background is quite different to, I think, many of your typical interviewees in that I grew up on the Cape Flats, a place called Belhar, which many people haven't even heard of. It's a very small town on the Cape Flats. And initially, you know, I wasn't always academically inclined. It's sort of late bloomer. In the old days when they still had standards, so standard eight, around about grade 10, I think, in the modern language, I started to get in sort of interest in accounting. And at that stage, if you were reasonably bright at school, your teachers and career guidance sort of counselors always advised you either become a doctor or an actuary. And I just thought actuarial science was a bit too complicated and too, you know, insurance driven. I'd much rather focus on the CA stream. And, you know, I set my mind on becoming a chartered accountant. Yeah, I think, you know, all my decisions post that, you know, selecting UCT and rallying for a BCom accounting was aimed at becoming a chartered accountant. As I always say, life happens and I couldn't finish my chartered accountant sort of journey. But then, as you've mentioned in your introduction, my first sort of foray in the working world was a company called Vendel Air, where initially I was supposed to be the assistant accountant. But the day I joined, the financial manager resigned. So suddenly I was this 24-year-old, fresh from varsity youngster that had to oversee the financial operations of a company with three branches in Cape Town, PE and Durban. So <laughs> that was quite a, a rude awakening. Thrown into the deep end, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I learned more in that one year and a bit than I learned at four years of varsity, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, that is always the case. Your first job has a much steeper learning curve. But then, you know, the the financial management world would have been at your feet. And many of the top entrepreneurs in South Africa started as financial managers or accountants at companies. When did you decide this is not for you, you would rather go into the investment world? Yeah, again, it was sort of fate that sort of decreed that I needed to go and make a career change. I really enjoyed that first job because it involved manufacturing, it involved running warehouses, all of the stuff that they don't teach at university. And I sort of was learning as I was going along. I mean, I was introduced to accounting software, which they never taught you at university and, you know, study the manuals and, and get to know all of those things. So, again, I learned all aspects of financial management, uh, given that uh, essentially it was myself and two bookkeepers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's really gave me insight into what makes businesses work. What are the pitfalls in running businesses? And unfortunately, that business, because it wasn't well run and sort of predated me, that quite a, a large debt burden, it was sort of heading towards liquidation. And as any sort of accountant would know, you try and avoid being in the sinking ship. And at that stage, Alan Gray was headhunting for somebody to run the investment systems. So after about a year and a half, Alan Gray approached me. I went for a few interviews and I got the job as investment. It was called Investment Research Database Administrator. Quite a mouthful. When were you first exposed to actual investments? Or let me put it differently, when did you buy your very first share or make your very first investment with money you have earned? Yeah, that's a good question because I think my biggest learning in life up to that stage was to try and avoid debt. Because I could first and see what debt did to this company that I worked for. They had left a legacy of creditors and unpaid bills. So, you know, when I started off at Allen Gray, as I said, I was sort of 
heading up the investment research system. And it was quite a unique opportunity in that uh, Alan Gray was transitioning from the old DOS-based sort of systems to more visual basic and data libraries and all of those technical jargon that IT people would know. And it was quite exciting because I spent some time with Orbis in London with the IT guys. We needed to change the systems. And bearing in mind, this is pre the year 2000. So Y2K was a big project that I was involved in as well. For those of you that are old enough to remember that. But to answer your question, I actually had no interest in investing in shares at all. I didn't know what a share was until I, I joined Alan Gray. And it, it was only when the late Simon Marie approached me in late 1999 and asked me, don't you want to come over to the full investment side? So initially, I was part of the investment team because I was sort of in servicing the investment team in terms of the research and the databases. So I was participating in the morning meetings and various meetings. But I always thought that this is not for me. It's too complicated. It's too risky in terms of what they were doing. But when Simon came to me, I really thought, no, this is a fantastic opportunity. And I grabbed it with both hands. So that's when my journey with actual investment started uh, in late 1999. But I really didn't thought of investing anything until, you know, life happens, as they say, you settled with home loans. And, you know, back then, interest rates were very high in South Africa. So the late Jack Mitchell always said, you know, the best investment you can make is to pay down your debt. So initially, my home loan was my major focus. And until I got debt free, again, you know, we launched the Allen Gray Equity Fund round about that time. That was my primary investment. I think for any young person, you know, if you don't really know much about investing, the safest thing you can do is to invest in a unit trust, but do your homework around those unit trusts. And I think those are some of the key learnings that I had at, at that stage. And, and just to reflect back, I think, you know, I was quite privileged in that at that stage, the late Dr. Alan Gray, he used to frequent and come to Cape Town quite often. I interacted with him a lot. I learned quite a lot from him. The late Simon Marie as well was a mentor to me. And they're very different personalities. If you compare Simon Marie, for example, always focused on key drivers, big picture. You know, what I learned from him is the essence of what makes a good investment. And I think he had an uncanny knack of identifying good opportunities. Then to contrast that, I work with Arjen Lichtenberg as well. I think he's now in Australia. And, you know, he was the consummate accountant. He's got a master's in commerce, for example. I learned from him meticulous, you know, model building, understanding accounting, why it's important. I remember those late nights we sat at Alan Gray's offices, you know, going through my models and making sure it's right. And then from Jack Mitchell, the late Jack Mitchell as well, I learned, you know, the importance of looking at the bigger picture, the interplay between equities and interest rates and why, you know, looking at inflection points and technical series history is quite important as well. So all of that sort of grew me in terms of shaping my investment view and I think to my credit, if I can be so humble to say that, I didn't really buy my first share until I was really ready. And that sort of happened much later on. Unfortunately, I've had some yeah, not so good investments, but uh, those are all learning opportunities. Now we're going to talk about those in a minute. I just want to go back. You were exposed to many different investment approaches, and there's always a debate. Some CAs would say, listen, you crunch the numbers and then you get a fair value valuation and you look at the share price. If it's under the fair value valuation, you buy, and if it's above, you ignore or sell. Then there are other models which look wider than that, actually analyzes the, the world that company actually does business in and the prospects thereof. So it is maybe a case of a science versus an art. How do you view it? Is it a science or is it an art or is it a combo? I think nobody's really got the answer to that yet. And I mean, earlier, you know, the Charlie Munger has passed on. And if you look at Jim and Warren Buffett, I mean, they are probably more in the camp of saying it's a combination of science and art, and there's a huge element of luck involved as well. I think in my sort of 25-year history, what I've learned is that what you can control, you try and control to the best of your ability, and that includes understanding businesses, understanding financial statements, but there will always be an element that is beyond your control. Nobody knows the future, and as a result, one always needs to build in some element of humility when you build financial models and, you know, when you do very sort of exotic things around forecasting, for example. So I think to answer the question, it's a bit of an economist answer in the sense that it depends and there's a mixture in there. But I think the great thing about investing is that it actually combines all of those skills. You need to be a technical person in terms of knowing how to read financial statements and how to build models from there. 
you need to also have a bit of a flair in terms of thinking bigger picture and thinking longer term in terms of this, especially the key drivers of investments as well. So a bit of a long-winded answer, but I think not really answering the question, but hopefully there is some sense in what I just said. Yeah, what do economists say on the one hand and then a bit later on the other hand, and then they cover all their bases. But what do you think young professionals who enter the investment market should do? Because most of those individuals are not finance specialists. They cannot crunch the numbers to any significant depth. And in many ways, they invest with their gut. What would your advice be for them to build a portfolio of investments? I get that question a lot. And uh, the easy escape that I use is that I'm not allowed to give advice. (laughs) But I think what is quite important is that, and the key difference, if I compare 25 years ago when I started out and now, it's just the volume of information available and the instantaneous nature that information is available as well. So that gives you an advantage, but it also brings a disadvantage in that, you know, the efficient market hypothesis has always been that all information is disseminated very quickly into the market. And that is no more true than today where there's so much information at your fingertips. And as a result, there's a lot of short-termism as well. So information gets absorbed by the market instantaneously. And because of that, people are very wary of taking long-term decisions or taking long-term views. And I think for a young person starting out, the biggest advantage you can have and typically when you're investing, is to actually try and unearth what is a long-term view that is not being priced in by the market at the moment. Now, that entails two things. It entails you to have a lot of patience. You need to have a long-term view. And, and when I talk long-term, I don't talk three and five years. It typically seven years, uh, seven to ten years, I think, uh, is actually a long-term sort of time horizon, which means that in the short term, there would be volatility. And I think if I look at our investment decisions at Commerce Asset Management, Probably the starkest example of that would be the PGM space, where we were probably three and a half to four years early into that sector, sort of 2012, around about there. And it took us four to five years to really see some positive returns in that sector. But when it does happen, it can be quite violent on the upside. And I saw the similar picture to Alan Gray as well. The late 1990s, we were quite early in some of those domestic companies, some of the mining stocks. We avoided some of those financial stocks that were flying high. It took us two years of pain. But when it turned in 2001, again, the performance was just extraordinary that you get. Timing, and that's, I think, the essence of what you just referred to. The timing of investments is critical. But when you have money in an an account, you have the whole universe of investment options. How important is timing when you need to make an investment decision because you can't see ahead you can't see two three years ahead you know when you buy something you expect it to go up immediately and if it doesn't sometimes you regard it as a poor investment i think it's only in the fullness of time and sort of a longer time horizon that you'll discover whether you were correct or not again this instant gratification syndrome that i call it where people want share prices to go up immediately the day after they bought it It really happens, and that is not a long-term sort of sustainable investment strategy. I think what one needs to do is to, first of all, look at fundamentals, look at sort of the key things that you think are important in an investment and identify whether there's, you know, a lucrative opportunity there and whether there's a mispricing in the market. Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible to time these things. The only thing we do know is, as I said earlier, what you can control. And what you can control is your research the information at your disposal to make those decisions. And then again, you know, investing is for the patient. It's not a short term. It's not a 100 meter sprint. It's, it's really a marathon. I know it's a cliche, but I think it really applies to investing as well. How do you approach poor investments? On this podcast, I've spoken to many professionals and they regard a win-lose ratio of 6 out of 10 as a good one. If they get six winners, they accept it. And then if there are four losers, they just hope those losers don't perform too poorly. But if you have a poor investment in your portfolio, when do you exit? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And the process that one needs to go through is always, I call it a bit of navel gazing. You need to look at yourself in terms of two aspects. Did you make a mistake in terms of your research? Or did you genuinely miss something that was either not disclosed or was hidden? or where the circumstances, and those two elements are linked with the circumstances beyond your control, resulted in you having an underperformer in your portfolio. 
And I think the easy one is if you've made a mistake, the best thing to do is to cut your losses immediately and admit you made a mistake and move on. I think the second one where it's nuanced in terms of you know, misleading information or you know circumstances, that requires a bit more work and you need to look at easier change in circumstances. And I can give you specific examples of those. Yeah, give us one. I think sort of in my personal experience, and, and I want to talk about one of the losses that I suffered, probably quite a big one in my personal portfolio. So in general, I normally just invest in unit trust. I think it's important for portfolio managers to invest in their own unit trust. So I would say the bulk of my personal investments are in the unit trust that I manage as well. But the ones that I strayed from the unit trust area, which has burned me quite badly, is Tongat Yulet, or Tongat, as it was known later on. And yeah, it was clearly a case of misrepresentation. And clearly, you know that there's still some court proceedings ongoing in that one. But, you know, clearly it was one where it, optically it looked quite attractive. Clearly with the, the portfolio at that stage, you had the sugar business and in South Africa in particular, you had a substantial land portfolio, which, you know, because of misrepresentation around realizations of that land portfolio, I think me and a lot of other investors effectively thought that this company was substantially undervalued. And it's only subsequently that we discovered that there was massive fraud in the business as well. Yeah, the same with Steinhoff. And it's very, very difficult to actually preemptively identify potential problems because in the case of Steinhoff, for example, I know there were one or two analysts who warned against a potential implosion, but there were at the same time 10 or 15 positive reports expecting above average future growth. It is very, very difficult. And the positive side, sometimes when you make a good investment, the share price or the unit trust really perform excellently or really, really well. When do you take your profits? Yeah, so I sort of have an internal rule that if you've doubled your money, you need to take at least some of the money off the table, <laughs> irrespective of how short the time horizon has been. And that's sort of my personal investment philosophy. But you continuously reassess. And even if a stock has doubled, you know, we've seen so many examples in South Africa where stocks have doubled and then doubled again. So selling too early is also not a great outcome for yourself or for your clients as well. So our process is to continuously look, relook at the investment case. Does it make sense? You know, is there still more upside as a result as well? But I think, you know, some examples that I can cite again in the PGM space, investing in Anglo Platinum at the bottom of the cycle, sort of 2013, 2014. And that share price has come from 250 rand. It went over 1,000 or close to 2,000 rand. So it's really done exceptionally well. Northern is another one, buying that one in the sort of 30s, 31 rand a share. And yeah, I mean, that one has been a 10 bagger as well. Obviously, it has retraced more recently. But yeah, I think, you know, again, looking at the longer term view and in 2013, 2014, when PGM prices were quite low, Everybody was bearish. The contrarian sort of investor in me said, no, this is fantastic opportunities. And uh, I think we're seeing a repeat uh, somewhat of that today in this current market as well. If you could go back and speak to Abdul when you were 24, when you finished studying, you got your first job, what investment advice would you give yourself? I think I've been sort of on a good wicket in terms of following my own advice. And I think the biggest learning and the biggest investment advice I can probably give myself is to spend a bit more time doing homework and don't take management's word for everything and be a bit more critical. And that would have been clearly stood me in good stead in terms of avoiding some of the losses over the last 20 odd years. But I think the biggest financial advice or investment advice that one can give, which doesn't constitute advice, I have to say that, is to pay down debt and to be as debt-free as possible uh, from an individual point of view. Obviously, some debt is good for companies and you know to be able to build capital and to invest capital. But I think you know in an environment where interest rates have risen quite dramatically over the last 18 months or two years, I can see, you know, firsthand family and friends, the impact that uh, debt has had on their sort of ability to to have uh, net savings. And in hindsight, many would have said, you know, if I'd paid down the debt earlier, they wouldn't be in the predicament that they are. The number one advice probably is to pay down debt and to try and invest with after debt earnings and savings. Yeah, I think many people pay off their debt and then afterwards they just enjoy the money they are saving. And the key there is after you've paid off your debt, use that money, the money you've saved and invest that so your whole portfolio and wealth can increase. That's the flip side of it. Definitely. And I think to link to that, it took me a couple of years to pay down my bonds. But that amount that I've been paying every month 
beyond, you know, after the bond was paid, I could continue to save that amount. So that didn't fritter away into lifestyle changes or anything mm. like that. And I think it's it's a bit of discipline as well that if you can afford to pay 10000 to 15000 a month in a bond payment, after that bond is paid off, I continue to put that amount of, of money away and continue to save as well. Excellent advice. Abdul, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights. Thank you very much, Rick. That was Abdul Davids. He's a portfolio manager and head of research at Kamisa Asset Management. Show me the money. That was the Money Web, the A Better Investor podcast with Rake for Kneecap. Thanks for listening. Catch up and listen to all the Money Web podcasts on moneyweb.co.za or the app. MoneyWeb, your trusted source for business and investment insights.